Get the Balance Right, a podcast for creative female entrepreneurs who want to get control of their finances, make more money, and live a balanced life. I'm your host, Heather Zeitzwolf, CPA and profitability coach. Join us each week to learn ways to run a more profitable business through inspiring discussions with financial professionals, business experts, and thought leaders. If you're looking for a quirky spin on business with a dab of woo-woo, grab your headphones. Together, we will break through our fears, live a life of abundance, and get the balance right. everybody. Welcome to Get the Balance Right Podcast. I am your host, Heather Zeitzwolf. Wow, it is 2022. Holy cow. Tis the season for New Year's resolutions. You got any of those? Well, if you caught my episode 71 with Rachel Cook, then you know that I was going to go on a CEO retreat to plan my goals for the year, which I did. And But did you? Did you uh, also set aside time to strategize for 2022? If you haven't yet, please do that. It will make your life so much better starting this whole new year. But if you did, what have you decided to work on this year? Did you create personal and business goals? I'd love to hear about your New Year's resolutions. You can DM me on Instagram at Zeitzwolf. It's in the show notes. Or you can post your resolutions in my Get the Balance Right Facebook group, which I'd love for you to join if you haven't already. If you're looking for accountability, the Facebook group is great for that. I would love to support you with your goals. There's a link in the show notes so you can do that. So what are your goals for your business? Perhaps they overlap like mine, business and personal. For instance, I'm promising to get more help in my business. Now, if you're a longtime listener of this podcast, then you know that I've been saying that for a long time, but I swear it's finally happening. I've been interviewing people. I've been getting things set up. I've been signing contracts and I set aside time in December to document my processes to make the dream a reality. Yes. Taking tasks off my plate will allow me to relax. Relax. I don't do that very often. It will allow me to relax and have more quality time with my family. I'm sure that you probably need the same as well. It's tough being an entrepreneur. And it will also make time for exercise, which I desperately need to do. Oh my God. Full disclosure. I got out my jogging trampoline a month ago, and I've used it once. Yeah, I was going to track it on my calendar. There's only one entry for the month, once. You know, years ago, this is way before Netflix, when we would use DVDs, I used to jog on my trampoline several times a week, watching X-Files DVDs. I called it Exerfilesing. Pretty clever, right? Exit filesing. This past year in December, I thought I'd get inspired to use my jogging trampoline again. So I got it out, put the legs on everything, but I haven't been inspired. Instead, it's causing me guilt and taking up a whole lot of space. I don't know if you've seen these jogging trampolines before, but they're kind of like a large circular thing with the legs sticking out. It's just kind of weird. And it just sort of propped up in the middle of my room, leaning against my shelves. And frankly, it's become this place where I toss my hoodies and my yoga pants. Ironically, the two things I could be wearing while using that contraption. Now, before COVID, all that, remember life before COVID? Oh my God. I used to walk and ride my bike everywhere. But since COVID, I rarely leave my house. And like within my house? Oh my God. I rarely leave the chair in front of my laptop. Okay. Who's got to get the balance right? Me. That's who. I got to get the balance right. Ugh. I just hate exercising. What about you? Hate exercising? I don't know. But I know I got to do it. That's the problem. But You know, maybe my disdain for exercise is similar to your loathing of taxes. 
Nobody likes tax time except for CPAs, and I don't even know if they like it. The thing with exercise and tax, they're both necessary evils. And the consequences of ignoring them are different, but both pretty brutal. You know, if you don't exercise, you can become really unhealthy and you could die. Whereas if you don't pay your taxes, you may not die, although there's this whole thing about death and taxes, but you know what? You'll end up in prison making license plates. Both are not optimal choices. Staying compliant with taxes, it's not pleasant. We know that, but it's something you have to deal with as an entrepreneur. I'm sure that when you saw the name of this episode, which I might even try to change to jazz it up to make it more enticing, after reading three tax tips, you're probably like scrolling to see what other podcasts were in your queue. Like, oh God, please, not that. But you're listening. So thank you for being such a brave soul and pressing play. Maybe you thought it was like a Band-Aid you had to rip off and you were like, oh God, I just got to get through this one. Whatever guided you to listen to this episode, I am so grateful for it. Thank you for being here. Thank you for being brave. But before we get into these three tax tips or whatever I decide to call this show, I want to address a misconception, which I hear a lot. And it's this idea that it's better to spend all the money in your business to save money on taxes. Okay, yeah. If you don't have any money in your business, yeah, you will pay less tax. But, all right, here's the thing. This is a safe space and I'm going to be blunt. If your approach to avoid tax is to lower your net income to the point of obliteration, your plan is flawed. I'm sorry, it's flawed. Having a positive net income means that you made a profit. Profit, that's good. Here's the thing that people get messed up on. They think, okay, if I don't have a profit, then I don't owe tax. Okay, well, that could be true, yes. But if you don't have a profit, that means you didn't make any money. That's not good. Now, I want you to understand that profit is different from sales. So having a positive net income means that you have a profit. What you make in sales is not the same as profit. So revenue and profit are different. Revenue is what you bring in from your sales. Profit is the amount that you have left from your sales after paying all your expenses. For instance, you can be a selling diva, but if your expenses exceed your income, then honey, you're broke. Ouch. Yeah, the goal is to earn a profit and to pay yourself for all of your effort. Unfortunately, many entrepreneurs fall into this trap where their sales on the surface appear to be phenomenal. But in reality, the cost to run the business is exceeding the sales. When this happens, This predicament is called a net loss. Sure, you'll owe less in taxes, and that may sound like a win, but it's important to note that as a result, you won't have funds to pay yourself or have any money to reinvest in your business. People get confused about this. If you've been confused about it, you're not alone. Sales and net income are different. Now, I know all of this stuff can seem stressful overwhelming, and just plain icky, especially regarding taxes. It's way easier to put on blinders and not think about all this stuff than to face it straight on. But if you keep your head in the sand too long, ugh, then the IRS will hunt you down, just like the mob. Have you seen Goodfellas? They want a piece of the action. And if you've passed the deadline... The IRS will hit you with penalties and interest, and these numbers can get really huge really fast. These penalties and interest are not tax deductible either. You can't count them as business expenses. Talk about putting salt on a wound. Ouch. Now, I'm not here to scare you, 
Instead, I want you to be prepared and face the tax demon head on. Think of it like a dragon. And you are the dragon slayer. And today I'm going to share my top three tips to help you as an entrepreneur get prepared for this tax season. I want you to know that the tax code is complex and these tips, these three tips are not an exhaustive list of tips. These tips should be used for informational purposes only. Keep that in mind. Yes, I am a CPA, but I do not know your unique business and tax situation. Also, depending on when you're listening to this, the rules may have changed. So I want you to keep that in mind. I know that I have listeners in different countries, so keep in mind that the rules that I'm going to talk about are U.S.-based, but the best practices in this episode, that doesn't matter where you're located. Be sure to get specific guidance from your CPA, tax preparer, and or a lawyer if you're working with one. It is really up to you as a taxpayer to do your own due diligence. Also, when it comes to taxes, I would advise you to take a more proactive approach than a reactive one. Some of the stuff I'm going to talk about in this episode is going to be more reactive. So if you've not been working with a bookkeeper or CPA or a profit advisor throughout the year, this show is going to help you get on track. By the way, I would advise that you take a more proactive approach than a reactive one. That's why working with a bookkeeper, CPA, profitability advisor throughout the year is so important to keep you on track. By the way, I offer all of these services through my business, Zeitzwolf Accounting. So if you need help, I'm here for you, okay? You can learn more about my business. You can set up a discovery call with me. The link is in the show notes. All right, now that we have that out of the way, let's move on. All right, are you ready for tip number one? Tip number one, validate your total revenue. This may sound like a basic idea, but this one can get overlooked, especially by a solopreneur or a newbie entrepreneur. I'm going to cover the areas where I find that people tend to trip up. Here we go. So this is part of validating your total revenue. Many of us, including me, are using payment services such as Stripe. These companies, they have a lot of fees. When Stripe or companies like Stripe move the money, the amount that's deposited into your bank account is the total after they take out the processing fees and sales tax. And the sales tax is only if you're subject to that. In other words, what they deposit in your bank account is not your actual revenue. I want to repeat that. What they deposit into your bank account is not your actual revenue. It's the net after they take out the fees and the sales tax. If you receive a 1099-K from these institutions, be aware that the numbers on that document do not accurately indicate your sales income either. Therefore, always confirm your revenue by looking at your year-end statement. On the year-end statement, it will contain separate line items so you can see what you actually made in sales before they took out the fees. I hope that makes sense. And if it doesn't, please go to my Facebook group and ask me questions because I want to be extremely clear on this. Okay, this is still part of tip number one. Even if you're using bookkeeping software, you must confirm your income in that software. Not only is the payment collected from Stripe an issue, but the software like QuickBooks, Wave, FreshBooks, NoHo, whatever you're using, The software doesn't always sync with your bank or your credit cards perfectly. So that means that it could be leaving things out or duplicating things. So unless you are reconciling each month to your bank statement, you can't guarantee that the funds in your books are an accurate representation of your income or your expenses. I've had clients come to me with their books where they had duplicates. They were actually going to report more income than they really made. Here's the thing. If you don't reconcile your bank accounts and your credit card accounts with the statements, as a result, you can either under or over report your net income. Now, I don't want to get too much down a rabbit hole on this. So uh, this is just so that you know, if you are working with a bookkeeper, 
then they should be reconciling your bank and your credit card statements every month. That's just part of what they should be doing. If you're not working with a bookkeeper, then if you don't know how to do this step, I would advise finding someone who does know how to do this. It is super important. This is something that's missed so often. People think, oh, I'm just using the software. It's so easy, but they don't know about that piece. I have seen books that were a hot mess that the client, when they came to me, they thought their books were clean and up to date. The thing is, is you're not a bookkeeper unless that's what you actually do for a living. So you're not going to know about all these little ins and outs of what's going on. And I can tell you that these software companies, they want to make you think that you do. But unless you know about accounting, you probably are going to overlook some things and it could result in you paying too much tax or too little. All right, moving on to this next area of validating your total revenue. If you are a contractor, but don't receive a 1099, you must report that income anyways. There seems to be some confusion on this. Some people think, oh, if I didn't get a 1099, it's like below some threshold, I don't need to pay tax on that. That is not true. Here's another one. If you accept payment in cash, such as for your services, you get cash tips, You must also report this as income. Just because there is no paper trail doesn't mean you can ignore this income. Here's another area. If you receive commissions or kickbacks from affiliate programs, you must include this with your income. And even if they've paid you with like an Amazon gift card, well, that's taxable income as well. So be sure to know All these different places that you may have affiliates with, you need to total up all of those and include them in your income. So be sure to include payment received via gift cards in your income. Now, if you've received donations, and I'm saying that with air quotes, donations with air quotes, such as through Patreon, that money is taxable and must be included as income. It's not a gift. It's not a donation. You're not a nonprofit. It's income. And if you do any kind of thing like crowdfunding through Kickstarter or something like that, those funds are considered taxable income as well. There seems to be some confusion on this. If you're receiving money for your business through crowdfunding, Kickstarter, whatever, that is considered taxable income. Just keep this in mind. The funds that you receive in your business are typically taxable. Now, there are some cases when they're not such as a loan, a special non-taxable grant, a tax credit, or some sort of non-taxable forgiveness of debt. If you've received funds that you think are not taxable, please be sure to discuss them with your CPA or tax person before excluding them from your income. All right, are we ready to move on to number two? I hope I haven't scared you too much. All right. So we got all our income gathered up, right? Next, we're going to gather up all your deductible expenses. One of the best things about being an entrepreneur rather than an employee is being able to deduct your business expenses. Now, let me be very clear. To be deductible, a business expense must be both ordinary and necessary with the expectation of making a profit. If you go to the IRS website, you'll read, that's what it says. All right. And I'm paraphrasing a little bit, but that's kind of the language that they use. Now, for this podcast, I'm going to assume that you're running a legit business and not a hobby. Now, why is this important? Well, starting in 2018, the IRS changed the rules and they said that if you have a hobby, you can't deduct the hobby expenses. However, all the income from this hobby must be reported and taxed. Ouch. So here's another reason why making a profit is essential. It demonstrates that you are serious about your business. So for this podcast, we are going to assume that you're not running a hobby, that you are running a business. It's really important that you run your business like a business. And for this podcast, we're going to just assume you are running a legit business. All right. Here's a mistake I often see when I take on a new client who's been doing their own books. They expense their entire loan payment. In accounting jargon, a loan is a liability, not an expense. Only the interest on the loan can be expensed. So if you have any loans in your business, I just want you to be aware of this. And if you're unsure 
how much interest that you paid over the year, you can look at your year-end statement and it will show the amount of principal paid versus the interest. So the principal is not an expense, just the interest. All right, this may sound confusing. And again, you can contact me through my Facebook group if you have questions about this. So here's the thing with your expenses. Because you can deduct them, it's so important to remember which expenses that you have that are tax deductible and include these on your return. Now, these may include things like vehicle cost using the actual expense method or the standard mileage rate method, which is based on mileage. Either method that you use, based on the IRS rules, you must keep your records contemporaneously. That's the language that they use. In other words, it is your responsibility to keep detailed records throughout the year if you want to take this deduction. So there's no guessing. You can't be like, oh, I think I drove this amount of miles. No, 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 no. You need to track this stuff. Regardless if you want to take the actual expense method or the standard mileage rate method, which can be more tax advantageous, but it really depends. And you have to choose which one you're going to do and stick with it. You'll need to log the number of personal miles and collect detailed information on your business travel. But the process by which you do this is flexible such as you can log this stuff on paper, you can use an Excel doc, or you can even do it through a phone app. They have phone apps now that will track your travel via GPS. Just be sure that you download this information on occasion because I had a client where they got locked out of their phone app and they were not able to access that information. But here's the thing, whatever you choose, pick the option that will keep you most vigilant about logging your miles. Other expenses you might be able to include as business deductions are your home office, internet, cell phone, health care, and retirement funds. Discuss these expenses with your CPA to verify which ones you can deduct and what the applicable percentage of each would be and the amount that you could deduct. The IRS has particular rules around this, which are strict. They're also as dry as a piece of old toast. So I'm leaving the details out of this episode. So to learn more, follow the link in the show notes. All right, moving on to another thing. Do you have a retirement fund? If you don't have a deductible retirement fund, be sure to find a financial advisor who can help you set up an appropriate retirement fund for your business entity. This is so important. They can help you choose investments based on your retirement financial goals, risk tolerance, and investments that coincide with your ethics. If you have an existing retirement fund, be sure to inform your tax preparer about the funds that you've already contributed to 2021. Please find out from them how much more you're eligible to contribute towards 2021 and how that amount will affect your taxes for 2021. Here's the thing, you have until April 15th, 2022 to make the contribution to 2021. It's pretty cool. Now, however, if you have a SEP IRA and you file an extension, then you have until the extended filing deadline or when you file your tax return to make that contribution. Keeping all this stuff straight can be a bit much. Just be sure to educate yourself. If you contribute too much or you're ineligible to make a contribution, you can wind up owing penalties until you correct that error. So be sure to ask your CPA and financial advisor any qualifying questions. Don't be afraid to ask. Make sure that you ask any questions that you have with your retirement fund. Here's another mistake that I find people making. Do you commingle your funds? That means that you use your business card for personal and your personal bank account for your business. Okay, so if you have commingled your personal and business expenses, such as using your business credit card for groceries, in that case, you'll want to make sure to exclude personal expenses from your business expenses. If you purchase business expenses with your personal credit cards, those expenses must be included with your other business expenses. Yeah, that's a lot to wrap your brain around. It's always best to not commingle funds because you can create a big, hot, juicy mess pretty darn quick. 
If you have commingled your expenses, you know that you did, you may need to get help untangling them. A bookkeeper can help you clean up your books and sort out that hot mess. It's worth it to spend the money. All right, moving on to number three, stay compliant and don't mess around. Rules and laws must be followed and taxes must be paid. So don't try to be cute. Save that for your Instagram reels. Here's the thing. If you decide to go into business, you are just expected to do certain things that are typically upheld by a government agency. It is your responsibility to keep your business compliant. Believe me, nothing will make you sit up straight and pay attention like a threatening letter from the IRS demanding thousands of dollars in back taxes. But it's not just the IRS. Staying compliant may include various things depending on your service or your products, your industry, your location. You may have to follow guidelines at the state level or abide by local ordinances. These may include proper licensing, insurance, permits, inspections, legal documents, and audits. You may be subject to local and state taxes depending upon where your business operates and if you have employees located there. You may have to collect sales tax or register your business with the Secretary of State. You might be subject to personal property taxes where you may owe tax on the assets you own. Ah. Local communities all have different rules. Therefore, you should educate yourself on what rules, laws, and taxes you may be subject to before making money there. Some states are worse than others. For instance, running a business in California is quite different than running one in Florida. Part of staying compliant includes filing and sending in payroll tax. You do not want to mess around with this. So I would advise using a payroll service. One of the benefits of using a payroll service such as Gusto Payroll is the service will transfer the funds and file the tax documents to the correct government agencies on your behalf. They'll also help you produce the W-2s that you need to send out to your employees. I personally love Gusto Payroll and I use that with my clients. So if you'd like to use Gusto, you can set up an account using my affiliate link that's in the show notes and you'll receive $100. So it's worth it. Okay, so maybe you don't have employees, maybe you have contractors. If you have contractors and you pay them $600 or more within the year, you must file a 1099 NEC to the IRS and send the recipient their copy by January 31st. NEC, by the way, it used to be 1099 miscellaneous. Now it's 1099 NEC. That's for non-employee compensation. So there are some exceptions for not having to file a 1099 NEC for a contractor that is a corporation, or maybe you paid them with a credit card. Be sure to read the rules around 1099s. Also, states frequently have their own rules around 1099s. So be sure to check your state's Department of Revenue website and see if you need to file the 1099s with them. If you're overwhelmed by this whole idea, many online companies offer 1099 filing services, which make the process easier. So you can go online and find one that does that. But if you need help with this, I also offer this as a service. Here's another one that gets people. Estimated taxes. Oh my God. Staying up to date on your estimated taxes is super important to avoid penalties and interest. It also helps you avoid a giant tax bill when you go to file. When you send in estimates, keep really good records as to when you sent in the estimate and how much. Estimates are calculated based on the prior year's income and should be adjusted and increased if you make more money. Be aware of that. Here's a tip. If you tend to forget to send in your quarterly estimates, you should set up a payment account with the IRS. You want to get this set up ahead of time before you need to pay because the IRS will send you a PIN. It comes regular mail. Once you get the PIN in the mail, then you can connect your bank and pay electronically using either a manual feature or set it up for auto pay. That's what I do, where you can choose the date and amount. This is so awesome. It'll make it so you never forget making an estimate payment. Now, you'll need to check with your state to see if they have a similar service, but Regardless, you should still be able to manually send payments electronically rather than mailing in checks through the state website. 
All right. Depending on your entity formation and how you've decided to be taxed, your business might be subject to its own tax filing, like a partnership return, an S-corp return. Then those earnings are reported on your individual return using a K-1 from the partnership or from the S-corp. And if you're a sole proprietor and you don't file as an S-corp, then you'll need to report the income and expenses on your individual 1040. Be sure to discuss this with your tax preparer and get clarity on how your business is being filed and when it might be more advantageous to be taxed differently. That's a bigger conversation than we're going to talk about today. All right, so let's go back over these. Number one, validate your total revenue. Number two, gather up your deductible expenses. And number three, stay compliant and don't mess around. Now, after listening to this podcast, have your goals for your business this year changed? Besides resolutions around marketing and sales, the sexy stuff, please consider making goals around the financial health of your business, which includes tax. I hope this information has been eye-opening or at least a really good refresher for you. It is not my intention to scare the bejesus out of you, but let's face it, unless you happen to be a bookkeeper, accountant, or a lawyer, chances are this stuff may not be in your wheelhouse. And that's okay. But as a business owner, you should at least be aware of this stuff so that you can seek out the right help. Would you like help to validate your total revenue, gather up all your deductible expenses, and be compliant? Well, if you're listening to this in January 2022, I currently have an interactive group program designed to take the stress out of tax filing. Whether you're using bookkeeping software or you have a pile of receipts, my program will help you get your business finances organized and ready for taxes, including getting your 1099s filed electronically on time and getting a handle on your state and local requirements. All right, my friend, thank you for listening to this episode. I hope 2022 is a fantastic year for you, your business, and your family. Remember to join my Get the Balance Right Facebook group if you haven't already so that we can connect. Or you can DM me on Instagram. All right. Happy New Year and happy tax time. (laughs) 